Let us lift our hearts and voices in praise, for today is a day of celebration and remembrance. We come together, united in spirit and in truth, to worship the Lord of Lords. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr., thanking you as always for joining us on this lovely day the Lord has made. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I just pray that this weekend, the weekend of Palm Sunday, that you are fully focused on what the Lord is doing in your life right now. I pray that you are happy, that you're healthy, and that you're protecting your joy from the craziness of this world. And I pray that you're motivated because life can be tough, but God is tougher. All right, so let's get started. Our scripture reading comes from Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. You know this scripture, but we love reading it. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. And maybe you do need that energy right now. Maybe you do need that endurance. And it only comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, people. It doesn't come from no one else. You need to get up, dust yourself off, and look up to the heavens and let them know that you're encouraged. Let them know that you're here and you desire that. But it comes to relationship, though. It comes through understanding who the Lord is and what he has done for you. And right now we're going to pray. Dear gracious and almighty God, as we stand at the gates of this holy week, we come before you with hearts lifted in praise and palms raised in celebration. On this Palm Sunday, we remember your son's victorious entrance into Jerusalem, an entrance that marked by the beginning of a journey towards unconditional love and eternal salvation. Lord, in your word, we are reminded of the everlasting hope that you offer those who trust in you. You are our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer. In times of weariness and in moments of weakness, you are the source of our strength and the reason for our resilience. So today we pray for the hope that shines through the darkest of times, a hope that is rooted in your unfailing love and promise. May this hope renew us, lifting us up on wings like eagles, empowering us to run without growing weary, to walk without fainting. As we journey through this week, from exaltation of the day's hosannas to reflection of Good Friday's sorrow and the joy of Easter's dawn, keep our eyes fixed on you. May the memory of this day remind us of your triumphant love, a love that overcomes all despair and uncertainty. Let's bless this time. Let's bless this silence in our focus right now and our remembrance of the, of the events that Holy Week brings. Fill our hearts with your endearing hope that we may always proclaim, even in the face of everything that we're going through, Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our King. Amen. The topic today is the Messiah they wanted versus the Savior they needed. The Messiah they wanted versus the, 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 the Savior they needed. We all want things here in life. We, we all want things and... Uh, but God knows what we need, though. God knows we want our Mercedes Benz, but we need a working vehicle. <laughs> God knows we want a mansion. He knows that. He, somebody out there wants a mansion, but he knows we need a home. God knows we want a wife and husband and girlfriends and boyfriends and just friends in general. But he knows you need companionship. Honest companionship. And he gives you that husband. He gives you that wife. He gives you those friends. We've all been there. Our, top, our text comes from Matthew 21, 9. Matthew 21, 9 reads as follows. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your already blessed word. We ask you now, Lord, to help us dive into what was going on in the scene. Help us understand what people wanted and give you the glory for sending them what they needed. And help us understand this lesson, even in our own lives. These and all things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm always weary of people in their political and social movements. I, I watch it with a people's eyebrow like the rock. <laughs> Most of the time, they're not going in the right direction anyway. We see that happen here in our own country where causes were dressed to look like one thing only to be revealed as something else that no one wants part of. Start, until you start reading the fine print of what they're really all about, then you're kind of like, eh, nope, this is not for me. And when you're done evaluating the cause, we evaluate the people that follow the cause. We look to uh, and around the emotions, the words, and we ask ourselves, are we fighting for the same thing? How many protests did you see throughout the years where the protest was began because something happened, but the signs and everything out there represents other things that are going on? Then I ain't protesting for the same thing. This country has been working for change, it seems like forever. And just when we think we're all pushing for the same change, we realize that we're really not. Big time battle cries made by leaders sound good until you realize the content and the context of the words. Because words can be made to tickle the ear and steer you in a direction you had no desire to go and it's scary when you don't even realize how you got there. It's about the vantage point. What we do here on earth is based on what we perceive it to be. That's how we respond to things. It's like a camera lens. When you see one angle is one view, zoom out a little more, you get a bigger view. And it isn't until you zoom all the way out is where you get the bigger picture of what God is doing. Uh, now in photography, we call this a three shot sequence. You get that establishing, establishing shot, pretty much everything. And then you work in closer, get a medium range shot, kind of crop some things out. And then you get that uh, very, very close up shot. But when you're dealing in the gospel, when you're dealing in understanding the will of God in your life, you got to go in reverse. You got to start with zooming all the way out to the establishing shot, not going from the establishing shot and zooming all the way in. You got to zoom all the way out to make sure that you understand the full layout of what you're looking at and what God is showing you. And you could say the same about the crowd that went ahead celebrating and followed Jesus as they, as he entered Jerusalem, presenting himself just, just as it says in Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, shout, daughter Zion. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on a foal of a donkey. And they did just that. They rejoiced. They shouted. The scripture encompasses these emotions. And it's from these emotions we can read and somewhat emotionally connect to what they wanted. But as a believer, we can see that it's a savior they needed. Why? Because God's grace has been zoomed out to the bigger picture for us. Not the small close-up these people had on Jesus. And clarity in your conviction is indeed a blessing by God to have. That's what's going on out here in the world today. There's no clarity. People aren't clear on their faith in Christ, so they're led astray by false prophets left and right. Some are already blessed to have, while others are working to have clarity. I encourage those working on their clarity, don't be shamed, just keep working. It's all worth it. We're all at a different place in our relationship. Same Jesus, different relationships but we come together amongst this autonomy to evaluate what this crowd wanted versus what they needed. 
The first observation here is the Messiah they wanted was a political leader, but the savior they needed was a spiritual redeemer. The crowd shouting Hosanna to the son of David expresses their desire for a political savior, expecting Jesus to liberate them from earthly oppression and to establish an earthly kingdom. He was the one that was supposed to shake up the system. How can we come to that conclusion? Look at the word Hosanna. This word is a transliteration or a version of the Hebrew word Hosanna, which means to save or rescue. When they shouted Hosanna to the son of David, this was a cry for deliverance from a kingdom bloodline that has come back into fruition before their very eyes. They want it out. And here comes their Messiah, just as the prophets foretold. And they're thinking, yes, he's the one. He's going to save us. He's going to rescue us from these awful Romans. However, the true significance of Jesus as the Messiah goes beyond earthly power struggles. The Savior they needed came to bring salvation and reconciliation between humanity and God. Where they were thinking deliverance from under the throne of Rome, he was there to bring them from to the throne of God. No one saw it coming because they weren't looking for that, and we can read that here. They wanted new leadership here on earth, not knowing they needed more than just new leadership here on earth, but new life in their souls to be in heaven with the Lord. It's oftentimes when you understand their feelings, you can almost empathize. Here we are in our own country feeling as if we too are somewhat sometimes oppressed by a government that could care less about the God that we serve. And the country finds itself waiting for someone to come along and liberate them from what many may consider corruption and injustice to the elect. It's important to remember three things when you experience these types of emotions. First, don't put politics before your salvation. Do not put politics before your salvation. The Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green parties, or whatever party else is out there cannot get you into heaven. There's no way you cannot justify putting politics before the cross. And that's the problem we see here in this country right now. We need cross before the politics. We need Bible before the politics. If you have hope in Jesus and fully believe God is sovereign, then whatever's going on down here, it's meant to give God the glory up there and God can use anything to do that, to make that happen, by the way. God can use any situation, can use us in that situation, regardless if we are comfortable or not comfortable or not, to give the kingdom the glory. I've always told people, a lot of folks don't like when I say it because they consider it discouraging, I consider it great. It's a fantastic time for ministry right now. It really is. I mean, hell is busted wide open. People are running around doing whatever they want and they're beginning to realize it's not what they need. It is a fantastic time for ministry. Now, only preachers understand that. Only, only preachers understand that. <laughs> uh, everybody else is kind of like, I can't believe you're saying that, Reverend Allen. I don't understand that you would even consider this a fantastic time. It's a fantastic time for ministry. It's a fantastic time for discipleship. And you want to know why? People are thirsty. People are hungry. And the things the world has been feeding and, and feeding them and giving them to quench that thirst, they realize it's not doing it. They realize that. And if you're a believer out there, you see it too. We all see it. We're just waiting for opportunity. So pray for the opportunity to present them real water, real bread, for them to be sustained off of. Second, express your certainty and your biblical clarity. Express certainty in your biblical clarity. If you've been blessed to be able to dive into God's word and you're clear on your relationship with Jesus Christ, share it. These people were thinking one dimensional. 
their physical status. We all been there. We all we all been there. But you know more. So do more. Third, use your biblical clarity of what Jesus came for to ensure others know the truth. This is not just for you. We're called to go out into the world and disciple the nations. It's not just for you and your house. If God has called you to a great place to be able to do that, and you're not doing it, you're not doing the kingdom any justice. Because he's called you to this office. He's called you to go out and disciple the nations. Disciple your neighborhood. Disciple your friends and family. Then finally, use your biblical clarity of what Jesus came for to understand that eternal separation awaits those who do not enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the truth. This is, there's no sugarcoating it. There is no waiting room. If you have not come to Christ in your physical life, then you will not see him in your spiritual. You will be judged and you'll be eternally separated. Hasn't happened yet. So you got time. Moving on. Our next observation. The Messiah they wanted offered temporary, temporary relief. I'm sorry. But the Savior they needed provided eternal salvation. The scripture says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It indicates the crowd's recognition of Jesus as a figure of blessing and deliverance by God. They acknowledged that he was sent from God, but not as the Son of God. It's in the wording, he who comes in the name of the Lord. When you slow down and read it, they recognize God has sent them someone they know to be the Messiah, the anointed one. But their expectation was limited to the temporal blessings and immediate needs. Overlooking the spiritual deliverance Jesus has to offer, which transcends their temporary circumstances. In other words, Jesus came to give life after life while making the life you have right now his. In your surrender and submission to Jesus, you are surrendering all to receive all. And when your vantage point is only focused on what's going on, you'll miss what's going on up there. Everything's focused on what's going on down here. You're not going to be focused on what's going on up there. I guarantee that. And finally, the Messiah they wanted brought a claim from the crowd, but the Savior they needed faced rejection and crucifixion. Look at these words from the angle of hype. Hosanna to the son of David. That's the, re that's the royalty of Jesus. The earthly royalty of Jesus, the bloodline. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the favor of God on their view of a king they can relate to. Hosanna in the highest heaven. That's the overall cheer of the people who are thankful that God has sent someone to save them, deliver them. But we know that's not the case. And when they find out, this would soon turn to rejection as the same crowd would cry out for his crucifixion highlighting the vast difference between their expectations and the reality of Jesus' sacrificial mission. And maybe you found yourselves here. Maybe you have uh, had people start out with you because they had ordained their vision of what you was going to do for them on your life and the will of God on your life. And then when they realized that God's will didn't match up with theirs, the rejection sat in and the persecution wasn't far behind. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they get angry. They get frustrated with you. They start chastising your methodologies. They start chastising why you're doing and why you're moving in, in a way that they're not familiar with because they have put this thing on you, okay? They have put this type of uh, destiny on you. And then when they realize that the will of the Lord on you has got you going in a different direction, a different mission, what happens is, and maybe you've experienced this, I know I have, 
What happens is this. You start getting the rumblings. You don't hear about it immediately. And then they, you know, they send their spokespeople out to you. Hey, uh, you know, we was really hoping that you would do blah, blah, blah. And then you got to let them know. No, that's not, that's not, that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing this right here. But we thought that when you came that you would be doing this, but you're doing that. And well, you know, that, that, that's not really where we're going. And then you got to correct them again. Well, you know, this is where the Lord has me. This is what I'm doing. And I hope you're very, again, clarity in the conviction here is very important. And then they, and then they, then they start getting angrier and then angrier. And then before you know it, you're completely rejected. You're not crucified physically, but they completely try to disarm you. And when they cannot disarm you, they disown you. And then from there, they move on to the next thing that they, they hope serves their needs and lines up with their value streams. Never knowing that what you are doing for the community, for your family, for your marriage is because of what God has called you to do through Christ Jesus. So yeah, maybe you've experienced this right here because they had a close up view based on their perceptions and feelings and not based on what God has. They're thinking God has sent them someone to remove them from the throne of Rome, but God sent them someone to bring them to the throne of grace. The bigger picture, folks, the bigger picture. Because you gotta make sure they understand what you do and why you do it. And make sure it's pointing them to the cross of Calvary when you do it, where our Savior died. Not just random goodness. The Redeemer is always the reason. Because unlike these people who celebrated Jesus only days later to turn on him, we are blessed to have the entire view. And we should take it in, take in all the knowledge, take in the entire scene to learn from it and to understand where this begins and where this ends. So let's utilize the blessing we have to know more than what they did and bring a world to its knees. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which, is also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has, all, has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that's a blessing of having the bigger picture. Now, maybe you're here and you need the bigger picture. Maybe you have been looking at God's word subjectively through the lens of people and internet sites and other groups and false prophets who zero in and never show you the big picture of grace. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're there and you want to understand the entirety of Jesus, not just someone's pointed subjectivity. Maybe you want to know for yourself. Maybe you need to know for yourself. I know you do. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to contact us via the information presented early in the show. Um, go to get-prayer.com. And I don't recall actually saying it this time around. It's the Lord going in a different direction today. But go to get-prayer.com. We are working on our website to provide all things prayer related. And we want you to be a part of that. We want you to know 
that the Lord loves you. We do too. And we want you to understand that sometimes we get lost in this thing called life and think that we're all alone, but we are not. So as you are, are sitting here on Palm Sunday, whether you are in church or not, you must remember that the Lord is going on this trek this week, this, 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 these movements for you. He's going to the cross for you. Whether you would believe that, or agree that, it doesn't really doesn't matter to me. I care less. The truth is, he's going to the cross for you, for me, for all of us. But the choice is yours to make to accept that truth. And if you're here, well, I hope that you are on that pathway. I hope you have. Because he's, he's taking a beating. He's taking a lashing. He's getting chastised. Everything you're going through, he went through worse. <laughs> Everything in your life you think you got, you think you had it bad, the Lord had it worse. And you need to understand that he loves you enough to go to that cross and be nailed to it, to take everything on him just for you to be able to have that connection to God through him. But it begins with understanding the relationship part. You got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is not just about getting baptized and now you're good. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I want you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And yes, baptism is a part of that because he was baptized. So if we're going to be like Jesus, well, we got to get baptized. Most importantly, we got to get around a body of believers who are going to help you and nourish you and help you grow in your relationship. So if there's any questions or anything I can do to help you, I'm always here. Go to get prayercom shoot me a message on there, and I can get back with you and let you know what that looks like. And I pray that you are enjoying your Palm Sunday. So until then, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And God willing, we'll talk to you next week. You take care.